Welcome to all everyone who's coming in right now. Please know that we will get started in just a few minutes. We aren't speaking yet. We're just going to get started in about a minute or so. We're waiting for some more participants to join us. Right. Welcome everyone to Jane Austen and Company. My name is Anne Fertig and I'm a doctoral candidate in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as well as the co-director of Jane Austen and Company. Jane Austen and Company is a free public humanity series hosted by the Jane Austen Summer Program. Our first series took place in person at Durham Public Library in 2019 and 2020, but we have now moved online with our free Zoom series Staying Home with Jane Austen, which will take place online throughout 2020. We were so thrilled to see so many people interested in signing up for tonight's program, and for good reason. We're absolutely delighted to welcome tonight Susanna Fullerton, all the way from Australia, to talk about dancing with Jane Austen. And my name's Inga Brody. Um, I'm a professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, and the uh, director of JASP, uh, the Jane Austen Summer Program, which is the umbrella organization for this series and several other um, literary ventures. And I'm also co-hosting this with Anne. Um, and after postponing, having to postpone our annual four-day event, the summer program in June, we've discovered the silver lining, this uh, many benefits of the Zoom medium and we're delighted the series has such a following. We actually had over 600 people sign up for tonight's event, which was the maximum we could, <laughs> we could allow. Um, that speaks to our speaker, of course. Um, and this virtual series enables us to bring in people like Susanna from that we otherwise, you know, where airfare would have been prohibitive in the past. So Susanna, whom, I, whom I've known now, we just established for I think 23 years perhaps, um, has uh, been president of the Jane Austen Society of Australia for just longer than that, 25, 25 years. She's the author of several works, and I'm afraid I'm gonna forget one of them here, but, but of uh, Jane Austen, Antipodian Views, A Dance with Jane Austen, Happily Ever After, Celebrating Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, Jane and I, A Tale of Austen Addiction, um, and the, a book about crime in Jane Austen, and I, Susanna will correct me, I probably have forgotten one or two. But she's a favorite speaker at the Jane Austen Society meetings, she's, um, and she's led tour groups to many places associated with Jane Austen. So her breadth and depth of knowledge is very, very strong. Um, contributed essays and articles to other books, and she writes a popular monthly blog, I love the title, Notes from a Book Addict. Um, and Suzanne is one of Australia's most popular speakers on famous writers and their works. She has a newsletter you can sign up for, which we will send. We'll send that link to you after the talk. Um, 
And again, we are just so delighted she can be here with us. I would also now like to introduce Emily Sparrow, our technical director for Jane Austen and Company, who will be moderating tonight's chat. Emily is also a graduate student and teaching fellow at UNC who has volunteered with the Jane Austen Summer Program for many years now, serving as our beloved registrar. Emily is going to explain how the program is going to run tonight. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Today, or rather tonight, depending on where you are, <laughs> Susanna is going to speak for about 40 minutes, and then afterwards we will have a Q&A session, which will go, which will bring our the overall program to about 90 minutes. So please stay with us after the Q&A session to hear about some of the exciting work coming out of Jane Austen and Company um, and about our next writing contest. Uh, for the Q&A session, so you might have noticed that this is a webinar rather than a Zoom meeting. You have a few options for participation. So I see that many of you have discovered the chat box already, which is wonderful. We love seeing where everyone is from. And feel free to use that chat box throughout the evening if you um, are having any technical difficulties or need any assistance from me. Then uh, you can use the Q&A box to ask your questions for Susanna and Anne and Inger will share those questions with Susanna when it's the appropriate time. Now you're welcome to throw questions in the Q&A box throughout Susanna's presentation, but please note that we won't be looking at them or stopping the presentation until, uh, until the appropriate time. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Emily. Just a note before we begin tonight, tonight's program is being recorded. If you have to duck out or have any technical difficulties, you can follow our Facebook or we'll send the link out afterwards to the recorded session. Without further ado, we'll hand things over to Susanna. Oh, I just need to share. Hopefully that is now all technically correct. And uh, I'd like to say welcome to everybody. It's fantastic to be talking to so many people on the other side of the world. It's a, a sunny winter's morning here in Sydney and uh, very chilly, but uh, the sun is shining and it's really fabulous to be welcoming you all uh, to this talk about the importance of dance in Jane Austen. So let's begin. Jane Austen once wrote in a letter, there were 20 dancers and I danced them all without any fatigue. She loved dancing, and her letters are full of references to balls, who flirted with who. She went off to informal dances in the homes of friends. She attended grand balls and stately homes. She went to public assembly balls and private dances in homes. So we get a really wonderful range of different dances within her fiction. Now, she put a dance. Oh, I'm not uh, getting my next picture coming up. Don't know why not. Ah, there we are. She put a dance into every one of her six novels. Pride and Prejudice, of course, has several very memorable dances indeed. And her unfinished novel, The Watsons, is actually the book that contains the most detailed description of a ball that we find in any of her fiction. So uh, it's a rather fascinating scene with a young child who's at the ball and becomes rather disappointed when his dance partner turns him down. Now, Jane Austen, of course, wrote for her contemporaries. So they would all have been very familiar with the rules of the ballroom, uh, what sort of etiquette, what sort of regulations, how one was expected to dress for the ball, all of those details, suppers, music, uh, the, the rules and regulations would have been well known to all of her contemporaries. So what I tried to do in my book, A, A Dance with Jane Austen, was really to show some of those aspects of attending a ball in Jane Austen's day and in her fiction, to try and recover some of that knowledge that, of course, as I say, her contemporaries would all have known, but we have now become less familiar with. Balls in her novels are absolutely essential when it comes to courtship. Now, of course, uh, balls have always been important in courtship. Think of, think of Romeo and Juliet falling madly in love with each other at a dance. 
We know that Jane Austen fell for Tom Lefroy when she danced with him and they conducted their romance or flirtation, we don't know how deep it was, uh, in the course of the dances that they enjoyed together. So Balls and Jane Austen's fiction do show us lovers, uh, would-be lovers, disappointed lovers, and those who don't yet know they are lovers, like Elizabeth and Darcy, uh, dancing with each other and, of course, enjoying it all very much. It's the Meryton Assembly Ball that starts Elizabeth and Darcy's uh, relationship, and uh, so much of it is conducted on the dance floor. Catherine Morland is first smitten with the delightful Henry Tilney when she meets him at a ball. Marianne and Willoughby and Sense and Sensibility have eyes only for each other when they are dancing at Barton Park. So dancing is hugely important in the courtship of the characters in her novels. And of course, it's when Emma sees Mr Knightley at a ball that it's the first time she starts to think of him as a possible lover. Uh, and she begins at that crown and ball to really view Mr Knightley in a very new way indeed. We hear that Fanny loves dancing with Edmund in Mansfield Park and her feelings come out then. And it's only two of her heroines, Eleanor Dashwood and Anne Elliot, who don't get to do any dancing at all with the men that they fall in love with. So I've always felt rather sorry for those two heroines because they don't get to dance with the men who they admire. Now, dancing, of course, could also bring quite a lot of misery to the heroines of the novels. Think of poor Elizabeth dancing with Mr. Collins. Nobody would want to dance with Mr. Collins. And Catherine Morland is desperate to escape the, attract, uh, the attentions of John Thorpe when she's at a bath ball. So dancing was really one of the few activities that Regency men and women could enjoy together. But it was very important to remember that there were obligations on the dance floor. Now Darcy and Mr. Elton and John Thorpe don't behave as they ought to do in the ballroom. And Jane Austen had very sharp eyes for incorrect behavior and she criticizes it within her fiction. There could also be men who used the dance floor as a place for ogling women. Lord Osborne and the, uh, the Watsons is a bad example of that. He struts up and down admiring the figures of the women, but he doesn't actually do his social duty by asking any of them to dance. In the ballroom, of course, you have chaperones, you have refreshments served, you have couples getting up close and personal and falling in love. So on with the dance, let's have a look at some of the details of dancing in Jane Austen's world and her novels. Now, learning to dance was very important. Mr. Darcy might comment, every savage can dance, but actually it did take quite a lot of instruction and learning. Mr. Collins has clearly not learned how to dance properly. And this is seen as a, a sign of really socially incorrect behavior. Poor Elizabeth finds that her dances with him are, quote, dances of mortification. Mr. Collins, awkward and solemn, apologizing instead of attending, and often moving wrong without being aware of it, is an absolute torment to his poor partner. And in fact, the one and only time in her fiction that Jane Austen uses the word ecstasy is when Elizabeth is released from dancing with Mr. Collins. We hear the moment of her release from him was ecstasy. I've always felt it was a bit sad that the one and only use of ecstasy in the whole of Jane Austen is connected with Mr. Collins. Fashionable schools all taught dancing. Country dancers were taught the correct carriage when you were moving around the ballroom, the correct forms of bowing and curtsying. And dancing masters would sometimes come into a neighborhood like the neighborhood where the Bennets live and they would teach several children. So the Bennets and the Lucases might well have all learned dancing together from the same dance master. Evidently the Duchess of Devonshire at her wonderful home of Chatsworth invited several of the neighboring families to send their children into Chatsworth. One dancing master taught all of them. And children's balls, as you can see from uh, uh, this picture of children learning to dance, 
uh, little balls held specially for children were quite common, so that children could gain the necessary skills before venturing out into the adult world. Uh, now, young Charles Blake in the Watsons is 10 years old, and he is allowed to attend an adult ball. We're told that he's uncommonly fond of dancing, and he asks his grown up adult partner for the first two dances, and she lets him down. And the poor boy is biting his lip with disappointment and trying not to shed any tears. And the heroine of the novel, Emma Watson, takes pity on him and says to him, I would love to be your partner. So he gets the pleasure of dancing. We're told that the Price children in Mansfield Park jump about together many a time when the hand organ was in the street. So when a little bit of music was playing outside, the Price children took the opportunity of learning to dance. But Fanny is perhaps still a little uncertain about her dancing skills, because before the ball in Mansfield Park, we hear that she is assiduously practicing her step. So she knows that it's important not to stuff up in the ballroom and be a bad dancer and a bad partner for somebody. A 1784 newspaper advertised instruction in the minuet, minuet de la cour and cotillion. And we hear that when James Austen, Jane's brother, is on the lookout for a second wife, he goes and brushes up his dancing skills. So learning to dance and doing it properly was extremely important. Jane Austen learned, of course, to dance at Steventon with plenty of brothers as her partners, and Henry Austen recorded that she excelled as a dancer. Now, dancing was, of course, one of the very few forms of female exercise. Uh, horse riding, of course, was something you could do, or walking, but not everybody had a horse, and every girl was expected to learn to dance. But it needed some fitness as well. And we, we hear in Mansfield Park that when Fanny Price is at the end of the Mansfield Park ball, she is left gasping for breath and clutching her side. So maybe she's had a bit of a stitch from all this exercise to which she is quite clearly not very accustomed. Now, dressing for the ball was also, this is another picture of, uh, of children learning to dance from the dance master. Dressing for the ball was hugely important, and it took up a great deal of female time working out what they should wear when they went to the ball. We hear that Elizabeth, thinking she's going to have a lovely evening dancing with Mr. Wickham, dressed with more than usual care. And balls were certainly a really vital opportunity for display or for advertising oneself as a possible marriage partner. The commentator and author Mary Russell Mitford said of women at dances, they dress to marry. So she put it very bluntly indeed. When Catherine Morland goes off to a ball, her chief concern is her gown and her headdress. What were the accompaniments for your dress? What other things did you need to think about? And of course, as you danced and moved around the ballroom, you were giving your male partner rather enticing glimpses of ankle or a rather low cut neckline and uh, you were showing off your nice figure so it really was a form of advertisement to a possible male partner and with rather clinging muslin fabrics that of course if you got a little bit hot and, uh, and damp from all the exercise the muslin would cling rather revealingly to your figure and uh, it was a very, you know, revealing way of showing yourself off to a man who might possibly be interested. Generally for unmarried girls, white was considered the most appropriate color for the ballroom. Um, Fanny, we hear, wears white. And uh, Catherine, we're told, Catherine Morland wears a sprigged muslin robe with blue trimmings when she goes off to one of the balls that she attends in Bath. Now, trains to a ball dress became something of a feature around the year 1800. Miss Bingley, we can be certain, would have had a very long tail or train to her very fashionable outfit. This shows Catherine uh, Morland and Isabella Thorpe 
pulling up each other's trains because of course if you were dancing and, and jumping and moving around and as part of the dance uh, a long train could be trodden on or could really get in the way so it had to be properly pinned up or sometimes even attached to something that you wore around your wrist and that would uh, make sure that it was not in the way of other dancers Usually some bosom was on display. Uh, one can be pretty certain, I think, that Lydia Bennett made sure that there was plenty of hers on display for the men that she was dancing with. And we're told in the Watsons that Emma Watson thinks the first bliss of a ball is getting dressed and ready for it. Women were also expected to wear gloves when they went to the ball, made of very light fabrics. Jane Austen writes in a letter, all my money is spent on buying white gloves. Sometimes they could be a very light kid or leather, and one had ingenious glove strings by which one could sort of pull the, the gloves up uh, and keep them in position. So uh, one was not having hot and sweaty hands passing across the dance floor. Uh, one had gloves on one's hands so that the, uh, the hot flesh was not touching other hot flesh. Shawls, of course, were also very important in the ballroom. We hear that Lady, uh, uh, Lady Bertram of Mansfield Park wants William to bring her a lovely shawl from the Indies. And of course, the graceful draping of a shawl, which one would leave off before one went onto the dance floor. You didn't dance wearing your shawl. Uh, but the putting of the shawl back on at the end of the evening, hopefully you had a nice man to hand it to you and maybe help arrange your shawl. So shawls too become a part of the flirtation in the ballroom. And Jane Austen mentions something called shoe roses. Now we're told that the Bennett girls order shoe roses for the Netherfield Ball. Generally, footwear for dancing did not have heels. They were, they were little simple flat shoes, quite often made at home. Uh, so the Bennett girls order the shoe roses, uh, often in a fabric that would match the dress that they were wearing. So it was a, a pretty adornment to one's dancing slippers. Uh, it would connect with the colors of, of whatever you were wearing. And uh, even the making of shoes was something that girls sometimes did at home. We hear that Mrs. Austen made shoes and shoe roses for her granddaughters. Jane Austen had a great variety of different colored dancing slippers. She had them in green, white, black, blue, and pink. And frequently they were tied on with a ribbon. So uh, one had to hope that one didn't have to do too much adjusting of one's ribbons and not tying and uh, making sure that they were, everything was in place during the course of the dance. And one also wore stockings to the dance. Uh, this shows some French stockings. Uh, and of course, if one could get French, that was very superior indeed. But usually one wore silk stockings for balls and they would have been tied on with ribbon further up the leg. One hoped that the ribbons didn't slip or again need too much adjusting in the course of the evening. And sometimes they had things called clocks on them. Clocks were sort of dainty lace inserts within the stockings so that if you were showing a bit of ankle, there would be a nice little bit of decoration uh, on the ankle. I guess in some ways, tattoos have taken over that function in our world today. Hair, of course, also needed plenty of attention when one was going to the ball. Uh, it was often curled, especially if one could pay a hairdresser or one tried to do it at home. And one had to think of decoration for the head. Miss Pilney, we hear, has white beads in her hair. Uh, so that would have taken some sort of clips of some description uh, to hold those beads in place. Feathers were very, very popular, but one was not expected to wear a great deal of lavish jewelry to a ball. It was seen as a little bit vulgar to wear a lot of jewelry. Mrs. Elton delights in, uh, in uh, uh, comparing pairing her own jewellery with that of other people. And she says, I see very few pearls in the room except mine. But I think this shows the vulgarity of Mrs. Elton, that she's feeling she needs to draw people's attention to the jewellery that she is wearing. Fanny, of course, famously in Mansfield Park, wears that amber cross, and she has to get hold of a, a chain for her cross. 
Edmund gives her one, Mary gives her one that's actually from Henry. Uh, so she ends up wearing both a necklace and a cross on a chain. But uh, she's, she's aware that uh, jewellery for a ball needs to be kept fairly simple. Another essential for the ball was a fan. Uh, William Price, we hear, is working away as if for life, calling his partner with her fan at the end of a dance. So fans were important for cooling you down if you got a little heated from the dance. But as I'm sure most of you know, there was a whole language connected with fans. And fans could be just wonderful for flirtation, you know, holding a fan up and glancing seductively over the top of it, or dangling a fan with complete disinterest if the wrong man approached you. Uh, there was a wonderful language of the fan. And we hear that Elizabeth Bennet very angrily flutters her fan when Mr. Darcy has annoyed her in the ballroom. For men, of course, there were also very strict dress rules. One was expected to wear knee breeches, silk stockings, and flat leather shoes. One did not, of course, wear boots into the ballroom. The Duke of Wellington was once famously turned away from Al Almack's assembly rooms in London because he was not wearing the appropriate clothing. And as I'm sure you can imagine, scarlet coats stood out wonderfully in a ballroom. They acted as a sort of magnet. And uh, it's commented in the Watsons that a scarlet coat in the ballroom would be certain to derange female minds. So it was a, such a vivid color when all the other men were wearing perhaps navy blue or dark green or black uh, for their coats. Uh, the scarlet coat was wonderfully noticeable in the ballroom. Jane Austen is, in her letters, uh, shows a great awareness of the difficulties of what to wear to a dance. She writes to her sister, I am so tired and ashamed of half my present stock that I even blush at the sight of the wardrobe that contains them. So again, her wonderful humour coming through, even though she has a difficulty of feeling that her dance wear is not as up to date as it could be. The next problem, of course, once you had sorted out what you were wearing, was how you got to the ball. Not every girl had a magic coach like Cinderella to whisk her to the dance. And it wasn't always easy to find transport. Jane Austen jokes about it sometimes in her letters. On one occasion, she actually got three offers. She writes, therefore, with three methods of going, there must have been more at the ball than anybody else. However, carriages were luxury items and young girls did not always have carriages and Jane's own family didn't have a carriage for quite a lot of her life in order to take her to a ball. Emma Watson has to go into town in a very simple cart and she has to stay the night with friends if she is to safely attend the ball. The Eltons are supposed to pick up Jane Fairfax and they forget, so the carriage has to be sent again. And poor Elizabeth Bennet feels horrifically trapped at the Netherfield Ball, as Mrs. Bennet has arranged for their carriage to come last to pick up all of the Bennets and take them home. So it was not always easy getting to and from a ball. Moonlit nights were the best. There was less risk of highwaymen and of accidents if one was traveling at the time of a full moon. So when the moon was full, suddenly lots of people invited others for their balls. Uh, and Sir John Middleton in Sense and Sensibility wants to hold a dance and says, oh, but it's full moon and everybody's busy. There's been loads of invitations gone out already. In Bath, of course, you could sometimes travel to a ball in a Bath chair. Catherine takes one from Great Pulteney Street to the upper rooms. And these would cost one to two shillings. So it wasn't all that cheap to hire a Bath chair. They were evidently often nasty, damp, smelly things, and one was in danger of getting one's lovely dress soiled in a bath chair. But after meeting Henry Tilney, Catherine doesn't care about any of that. And we hear she danced in her chair all the way home. It's a rather lovely moment of thinking Catherine so happy she's met this lovely man and she's sort of continuing to jiggle away in the chair as it takes her back to the lodgings. Now, Jane Austen knew many different sorts of balls. And of course, one of the most popular was the assembly ball, 
the shows and assembly ball in Bristol. And I love the little bit at the front of the picture where one young lady is obviously having to adjust those shoes or shoe roses and a friend is there on her knees helping her fix up her feet before she gets up to dance. We get so many wonderful assembly balls in Jane Austen's novels. Elizabeth and Darcy meet at one, Catherine and Henry, uh, Elizabeth Watson and Mr. Howard, Jane and Mr. Bingley, they all meet each other at assembly balls. So in the time of King George III, towns all over England held assembly balls. In an inn or in some public building, notices would be put into the paper to let people know that these things were coming up. Musicians were hired and these balls were open to anyone who could buy a subscription ticket. So Mrs. Robert Watson in The Watsons says that the Croydon assemblies have become rather too mixed. So she feels that they're open to all the, the hoi polloi uh, and she's rather above the people that attend. And of course, John and Isabella Thorpe attend assembly balls and one feels that they're open to the rather vulgar thoughts, then obviously anybody could come. But the nobility was really expected to patronise these uh, assembly balls uh, and in the Watsons the Osbournes of Os Osborne Castle are expected to put in an appearance and clearly Darcy and Bingley are expected to turn up at that Meryton assembly ball at the start of Pride and Prejudice. Catherine in Northanger Abbey actually goes to five assembly balls. The first, the third and the fourth are at the upper rooms in Bath. The second takes place at the lower rooms, and the fifth one, we're not actually told by Jane Austen what the venue is. And at places like the upper rooms, there were very, very strict rules and regulations. You needed an introduction to your partner. And at the upper rooms, the dance finished strictly at 11 p.m. Even if people were mid-dance, they stopped dead on 11 p.m. And that was it, you all then had to go home. This shows the, oh, this is also the, the wonderful upper rooms, a glorious place that you can still visit in Bath today. The lower rooms have now gone. You can no longer go and see the lower rooms, but it's in these rooms that a man called Mr. King, who was the real master of ceremonies at the lower rooms, uh, he has a little tiny role in Northanger Abbey and he introduces Henry Tilney to Catherine Morland. Paul Catherine has a bit of a trial at some of the balls that she goes to. Uh, in fact, Jane Austen puts her through some rather delightful mock Gothic trials when she's trying to escape from the attentions of the very vulgar and unpleasant and tedious John Thorpe. Jane Austen knew all about assembly balls. She attended them in Basingstoke, which was eight miles from Steventon, held in the Basingstoke Town Hall on the first floor. She attended assembly balls at the Dolphin Inn or Hotel in Southampton. She went to assembly balls in Deal, Lyme, Canterbury, Ashford, Bath, Faversham. Assembly balls were a really vital part of her social life. And of course, it's absolutely vital in Pride and Prejudice. But Mr. Darcy will not dance there. We hear he spent the rest of the evening in walking about the room after his dance with Miss Bingley. And this is very, very poor behavior on the part of this hero that we love. Uh, Mr. Bingley, we hear, is far more polite. He danced every dance and he changes partners frequently, although he does come back to Jane Bennett twice. Uh, so he is doing his social duty at the Meryton Ball. We hear also at this Meryton Assembly Ball that Kitty and Lydia behave in a rather indecorous way. And Mr. Bennett stays at home in his library. And Mr. Bennett should have gone with five daughters to keep an, an eye on, uh, a wife who might need his, uh, his assistance or uh, his companionship at the ball. He really is not doing his duty by his local society by staying at home in his library. So Jane Austen reveals in these assembly balls so much about the behavior, the personalities, the morals and the social duties of her various characters. 
Now, private balls were a far more exclusive affair because, of course, they were invitation only, people were not paying to come, and the host could invite who he liked. Mr Bingley, we hear, sends out his card and he orders white soup when he is planning the Netherfield Ball. We get private balls in Sense and Sensibility. We hear of Sir John Middleton. In winter, his private balls were numerous enough for any young lady who was not suffering under the insatiable appetite of 15. So the Sense and Sensibility balls and dances are important. Marianne and Willoughby, we hear, are partners for half the dance, and they have eyes only for each other. Now, they too are not doing their social duty. Uh, they should be, uh, they should be uh, only dancing twice with each other, the two sets of dancers, uh, and then they should go off and dance with other people. Uh, so they make themselves rather conspicuous, and they are talked about because they are really not doing their proper social duty. Uh, neither thinks of their social obligations. Pride and Prejudice has two private dancers. We get the first one at Sir William Lucas's house when Darcy begins to admire Elizabeth's fine eyes. And in a rather wonderful scene, Sir William tries to give Elizabeth's hand to Darcy. And he says, you must allow me to introduce you to a very agreeable partner. And it's a lovely little foreshadowing of Darcy's later proposal, you must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. Jane Austen makes that rather nice little repetition to connect the, uh, that, that moment when they dance together and the moment when Darcy proposes. The second ball in Pride and Prejudice is of course the Netherfield ball and Elizabeth finds it a pretty unhappy experience. Wickham doesn't turn up, she has to dance with Mr. Collins, and Mr. Darcy is annoyingly silent. So uh, I think Jane Austen uses the Netherfield ball quite wonderfully when the couple are dancing with each other. I think the movement of the dance reflects the to and fro conversation that the couple end up having on the dance floor. It, it's quite a brilliant scene, the way in which she has movement to reflect what is happening emotionally to the couple. Uh, and there's Sir William Lucas presenting uh, Elizabeth to Mr. Darcy. Mansfield Park has two private dancers. The first one is a very informal one. We hear it's the thought only of the afternoon. And it's because they've suddenly found that one of the new servants down in the servants hall is musical and is able to play the music for them. So they suddenly decide to have a bit of a dance. Furniture is moved back. And we hear it was Fanny's first ball, though without the preparation or splendor of many a young lady's first ball. So it's very informal. And then poor Fanny is left without a dance partner because her cousin Tom simply can't be bothered. He won't dance. So he's another one who is unaware of his social obligations. Suddenly, as you can see in this illustration, Aunt Norris appears and she wants him to join a card game. Tom thinks, well, dancing's the lesser of two evils. And he says, come, Fanny, come on, hurry up. What are you waiting for? Let's go and dance. So Fanny eventually does get to dance. But the dancing that's going on in that room is, again, fabulously described by Jane Austen, because everyone is dancing with the wrong partner. Mariah Bertram is dancing with Mr. Rushworth, but she's looking at Henry Crawford. Uh, Edmund is, is uh, dancing, but you know, there's this general mismatching of, of everybody in that room, and nobody is particularly happy, apart from Fanny, who does finally get to, uh, uh, to dance with Tom. She doesn't care much about Tom, she just wants to be up and dancing. And then we get Fanny's first proper ball when Sir Thomas decides to hold a, a formal private ball at Mansfield Park. And this, of course, is very much a ball for display and advertisement. He wants to show off Fanny as a desirable wife to Henry Crawford. But again, it's a ball that's not terribly happy for many of the people who are there. Edmund is depressed. Mrs. Norris is interfering with everybody. Mary is cross because Edmund's going to become a clergyman. And Fanny does get pleasure from it. 
club, even though she does have to dance with Henry Crawford, and she goes off to bed, feeling, in spite of everything, that a ball is indeed delightful. So dancing in Mansfield Park really is not shown so much in, in uh, forwarding courtship within the novel. It's really connecting with many of the great themes of that novel, such as selfishness, pride, power, and competition. And the dance reflects all of those themes in such incredibly skillful ways. So it's worth going back in that magnificent novel and just rereading those ball scenes and see, see how Jane Austen handles it all so superbly. Uh, Emma gets to dance as well, of course. There's an informal little dance at the Coles uh, when they're having dinner there. Once again, it's not planned as a ball, but a suggestion arises, and we can be pretty certain it's Frank Churchill who suggests it because he wants to dance with Jane Fairfax, uh, and suddenly the characters find themselves dancing. But again, it's something of a mismatch because Emma is dancing with Frank, but she's watching Mr. Knightley. And Frank, when he dances with Emma, is watching Jane Fairfax. So again, there's a huge amount happening on this ball, uh, this dance floor, and uh, Jane Austen is handling it wonderfully, uh, you know, in a very sophisticated way. And then we get the dance at the Crown Inn, which is planned, postponed, planned again, and discussed. This dance at the Crown Inn takes place in a public space. It's at the inn, of course, but it is a private ball because it's invitation only from the West End. And Jane Austen just achieves so much with this wonderful scene. The Eltons are very rude and Mr. Elton does not do his duty and ask Harriet to dance. And Emma begins to look at Mr. Knightley with new eyes. And we get this great description of his tall, firm, upright figure. And the graceful movement in this ballroom is all Mr. Knightley's. Emma is not described as being graceful, Mr. Knightley is. We see Mr. Knightley's superb moral qualities in the scene, in his rescue of poor uh, Harriet, who you know, Mr. Uh, Elton has refused to dance with. And we also get one of my favorite moments in the whole of Jane Austen, when Emma breaks the rules a little bit by asking Mr. Knightley to dance. She says, with you, if you will. After all, we are not so much brother and sister as to make it at all improper. And Mr. Knightley replies, brother and sister, no indeed. And we know exactly how Mr. Knightley is feeling when he says that. Now, brothers and sisters could dance together when they were learning as children, but they were not expected to dance at any sort of formal ball uh, together. Uh, that, after all, was, you know, they couldn't marry each other. They were taking up a partner that should be dancing with somebody else. Persuasion has a little bit of dancing at the home of the Musgraves, but poor Anne doesn't get to dance. She sits at the piano playing the music so that others can dance. And we hear that her eyes are full of tears as she plays those pieces. It's a very poignant moment in Persuasion. And she sees other people, other girls, dancing with the man that she is in love with. So it's, a, it's a, a sad moment for poor Anne. And no doubt she danced with Wentworth when they first met each other eight years before, but we don't get to see Anne dancing in the course of the novel. Now, there was a lot of etiquette, of course, connected with the ballroom. You had to be invited. You needed proper introductions. Bingley asks to be in, introduced to Jane at the ball. Um, and you could not refuse a man's invitation unless you were prepared to sit out the rest of the ball. So if Elizabeth refuses Mr. Collins, she can then do no more dancing for the course of the entire evening, unless she wants to be really rude and break the rules. Now, there was a maximum of two sets or two pairs of dancers with the one man, and after that you were supposed to move on to other partners. Gentlemen were expected to ask partners and not strut, and strut up and down the ballroom, uh, refusing to do so. But of course, some men break that rule. Tom Bertram, as I explained, Captain Tilney, and Lord Osborne in the, uh, the, in the Watsons. 
And you needed a master of ceremonies to make sure that all the rules and regulations were followed at an assembly ball. And uh, then at the end of a dance, once you had uh, enjoyed the dance with the partner, you were expected to return her to her chaperone. Henry takes Catherine back to Mrs. Allen uh, at the end of their dance. You were also expected to be prompt and punctual in claiming your partner, and John Thorpe, again, fails here. And you should not save too many dancers in advance, so your dance card could not be completely full when you arrived at the ball. Again, it was seen as, as uh, thwarting the correct social duties. You were also expected to uh, dress appropriately and interestingly in an era where we tend to tell other people frequently that they look nice and comment on what they're wearing, um, complimenting somebody on their appearance was not the dumb thing in a ballroom. Uh, it was expected that a woman would look attractive and be well dressed and appropriately dressed for the occasion. So if you complimented them it was actually seen as, as being rather incorrect. Uh, Miss Bates says, oh, mustn't compliment, I know. But Mrs. Elton is not very happy with this. And uh, she's so upset by the sort of lack of compliments she feels she should be getting that she takes on complimenting herself, which tells us a lot about the vulgarity of Mrs. Elton. And dances could last for a long time. A dance could sometimes be 30 to even 40 minutes. So fabulous if you're dancing with Mr. Darcy. But imagine 40 minutes of Mr. Collins treading on your toes or dancing with a man who had seriously bad breath. And, you know, it could be a real misery uh, being stuck for 40 minutes. And, and it meant that getting the right partner for a dance was hugely important because a very large chunk of your evening would be spent with this partner. And of course, as we hear, opening a ball was very important and there was plenty of regulations connected with that. Elizabeth Elliot in Persuasion opens every ball of credit for 13 winters. And when one has bridal status like Mrs. Ilton, then one gets to open the ball as well. This is a famous ball held by the Duchess of Richmond on the eve of the Battle of Waterloo. And of course, you can see that men with scarlet coats are uh, drawing the eye uh, instead of the, the men who are just wearing the plainer colours. So officers were very popular in a ballroom. In fact, we were told that women like mackerel are caught with a red bait. So the red bait of the officer's coat was very important and attractive in the ballroom. So we get Captain Tilney, Mr. Wickham, Colonel Forster, and the other men of the regiment of Meriton. Naval men were not as conspicuous in a ballroom. They tended to be dressed in a much more sober way. Uh, so men were expected to do their duty and Elizabeth Bennett at the, in the famous scene in, in Pride and Prejudice when Darcy describes her as only tolerable is actually sitting out a couple of dances. Charlotte Lucas doesn't always get a partner. Mary Bennett, I think, very rarely gets a partner. Anne Steele in Sense and Sensibility. There are a lot of characters in the novels who lack partners. And there was sometimes a real shortage of men at a ball. So sometimes women even stood up and danced with each other if there were no men available as partners. Mr. Bennett tells Lydia that balls will be prohibited unless you stand up with one of your sisters. So the threat of being made to dance with your sister was a pretty ghastly one. Now Jane Austen, of course, knew many different types of dancers. This one shows the boulanger, which was a, a circular dance, often put on at the very end of the evening. And the music was quite fast, so it got everybody quite worked up and excited as a good way of ending the night. Jane Austen danced the boulanger at Gunston, and it was also danced at the Meriton Assembly, where Elizabeth and Darcy meet each other. But by far the most popular dancers were the country dancers. These were the preeminent dancers of Jane Austen's era. Couples weaving through a variety of patterns, long lines of couples, sometimes jumping, sometimes clapping, lots of bows and curtsies. These were the dancers that Jane Austen's characters do most of all. 
This shows the cotillion, which by Jane Austen's time was, was being regarded as a rather old fashioned dance. It was being replaced by the quadrille in popularity. But Catherine in Bath dances at a cotillion ball. And the cotillion could sometimes give a little bit more physical contact than country dancers always did. So uh, some people were fond of it for that reason. The minuet would have been a dance much more familiar to Jane Austen's parents than to her own generation. It was a very stately, formal, measured sort of dance, considered by Jane Austen's time very old fashioned, but it did last longer in Bath than anywhere else. And the quadrille, here you can see it being danced for the first time at Almax uh, with Lady Jersey, one of the famous patronesses of Almax. It involved four couples in a square formation, and I fear Mr. Collins would have found it far too difficult to learn the quadrille. Mr. Darcy talks of reels and, of course, the waltz, which came in right at the end of Jane Austen's life. I don't think Jane Austen ever actually danced the waltz. The Duke of Wellington's officers brought it into England around 1815, and it was considered a rather scandalous dance. There was that arm around the female waist, uh, and the fact that couples sort of went round and round in circles, and people thought actually dancing the waltz might send them a bit mad. Um, so there was a lot of suspicion of the waltz. We hear that Mrs. Weston plays country waltzes on the piano, but the couples dancing to her music would not have been dancing the waltz. And just a last couple of things. The supper served at a ball was always very important indeed. Balls tended to begin around about 8 or 9 p.m. You would do about three to four hours of dancing and then you would have supper. So a supper could be served as late as 1 a.m. Uh, but going to supper with the right partner was a very important part of courtship. Uh, so you really hope that the right man asked to take you in for supper after the dance just before the supper began. And it was really quite a substantial meal. Mr. Bingley orders white soup, but there would have been cold ham and chicken, poached salmon, fruit, salads, cakes, and jellies are served at the Mansfield Park Ball. We hear that Mrs. Norris takes home the supernumerary jellies after the ball, one of Mrs. Norris's lovely little bits of pinching things that she thinks nobody else would want. When it came to drink, lemonade was served, tea, coffee, sweet wines like Orgiac and Ratafia, and Negus is served at the Mansfield Park Ball. Fanny goes to bed with her head full of Negus. But there was quite heavy drinking at balls, and Jane Austen noted at one ball she went to with great delight that Mrs. Badcock was running round the room after her drunken husband. And uh, one can see her delight in reporting that to her sister. But at the upper rooms in Bath, only tea was served at the ball. So you probably went home fairly hungry from the upper rooms. So ballroom courtships are wonderfully handled by Jane Austen. We hear in the Crown Inn Ball with Emma, her eyes invited him irresistibly to come to her. And Mr Knightley, of course, cannot resist that invitation. But one has to, I think, feel for the chaperones who sat at the side of the ballroom, probably longing for bed, um, just wanting the whole thing to end so that they could get home in comfort. And, and we do get pictures of chaperones in Jane Austen's novels. Mrs Jennings must have chaperoned all, both of her daughters to balls. Mrs Allen is Catherine's chaperone. Lady Russell probably went to, took Anne Elliot to balls. And Mrs Edwards chaperones the girls in the Watsons. And the last pleasure of a ball was, of course, talking it all over the next day. It's described by Jane Austen as discussing the shade of a departed ball. That the Miss Lucases and the Miss Bennets should meet to talk over a ball was absolutely necessary. So the fun of a ball did not just end when everyone went home to bed, it was continued the next day. And a gentleman was often expected to call on his dance partners of the evening before, make sure that they were not too exhausted by their dancing and hopefully, of course, to continue the flirtations that might have gone on the night before. 
Danny is longing to talk over the ball uh, the, the day after the Mansfield ball, but poor Lady Bertram can't remember who danced with whom or who said what about Fanny's dress, and Fanny finds it a very frustrating experience. She needs to get together with Mary Crawford in order to properly talk over that ball. But Jan Austen loved the preparation, the ball itself, and all the after effects of a ball. And we know that balls are hugely important, not only in her life, but in her novels. And they do form some of the most romantic scenes within her books. Just picture those candlelit rooms, the whispers, the smiles, the rustles of a muslin, the female and male closeness as the chaperones are left at the side of the room, and you can manage a little bit of flirting. And of course, for any young woman, and for any young man, there was always the promise of romance. So no wonder Jane Austen could write that there was, quite simply, nothing like dancing after all. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Susanna. Now, do I need to stop my PowerPoint, Anne, or? Why don't you stop sharing it so we can see you full screen? That would be great. Stop share. There we are. <laughs> so well, thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. Pleasure. <laughs> so now we're going to move on to the Q and A. And just a reminder to all of you all that are watching, if you would like to add questions to the Q and A, please use the Q and A box at the bottoms of your screen. Inger, would you like to begin? Sure. Um, so one of our attendees asked the question about, well, there were actually a couple of questions about color. Um, one, she, she writes, uh, um, was white considered a posh color to wear to the ball or was it really only an appropriate color for unmarried women? And she gives the well, example yeah. of, of the 2005 Pride and Prejudice showing nearly every woman um, at the Netherfield Ball wearing white. Yes. Well, white was, of course, considered a, a virginal colour. Uh, so that was important for young single women. Uh, Edmund Bertram in Mansfield Park notices Fanny's white dress with glossy spots on. And he says, a woman can never be too fine when she is all in white. Uh, so it was considered a very appropriate colour. But I think also it did denote wealth to some extent, because keeping a white dress clean, as any of us who've had white trousers know, um, you know, it can take a bit of effort and one couldn't turn up in a soiled dress to the bath, uh, to the ball. So I think it, it showed that, you know, you, you had some perhaps maids who were there looking after your, your white dresses and making sure that they were properly laundered. Uh, so it wasn't essential to wear white. Uh, Jane Austen famously comments that she could picture uh, Jane Bennett, or what, once she becomes Mrs. Bingley, uh, dressed in green and Elizabeth uh, Darcy in yellow. But uh, generally, white was considered the, the most suitable uh, colour for a ball dress. And you could add a bit of colour with your ribbons or your, you know, your accoutrement that went with the dress. You had this wonderful image of the dances ending precisely at 11 p.m. Some other people, some people were wondering, like, was that a very common thing? How long did dances typically last? Um, you know, we saw in the most recent Emma adaptation, right? Like, they're going till sunrise. Was that something that ever happened? Well, if it was a private ball, say if Sir John Middleton was holding it, one can imagine that it went on and on and on because he's such, such a, a, a party animal. Uh, so there were no regulations when it comes to private balls. Uh, I guess people, you know, gained a sense that one left at an appropriate hour. And Mrs. Bennett, by making sure her carriage comes last, um, is, becomes very unwelcome. All the other guests have gone and the Bennett carriage still hasn't turned up and when's this wretched woman going to take her, her daughters and go home? Uh, but certainly the, the bath balls had very, very strict regulations. And these have been pretty much brought in by Bo Nash, who was the great sort of arbiter of, of bath society. And he had brought in these extremely strict regulations about what one could and couldn't wear, the introducing that went on. And he said they had to end at 11 o'clock and at 11, you know, 
it might have come as a relief if you were dancing with Mr. Collins, but imagine Catherine with Henry Tilney being told, right, that's at 11 o'clock, it's all got to stop, you've got to go home. So, yes, I think it must have been really frustrating. And uh, the length of dance, I think, is fascinating because if, you know, young people go to a dance today, they, you know, they dance together for, I don't know, five or ten minutes and then the song ends and they might move on to somebody else. But it was a really long time, 30 minutes, stuck with John Thorpe or Mr. Collins or, you know, somebody you really didn't want to be with, um, was, a, was a very long time to be stuck with them. Uh, or somebody with bad breath or someone who trod on your toes and got all the steps wrong. So it could be a very miserable experience. And no wonder Catherine sort of scuttles around the ballroom trying to avoid John Thorpe because she just does not want to have another 30 to 40 minutes with him. So um, you mentioned dance cards. Um, so there were a couple of questions about that. Were they primarily for the assembly type of dance and not for private dances? And yes. secondly, to what extent were they actually paper um, that, that people would mark? And to what extent are these mental, uh, mental dance cards? Well, dance cards came into their own much more in the Victorian era. They were still in quite an early stage in Jane Austen's day. So they were more sort of informal. Um, but, you know, you did, uh, you did tend to ask people in, a, in advance. I mean, Edmund Bertram goes down to the Mansfield Parsonage to secure Mary Crawford for the first two dances. So he's not going to wait for the evening. He wants to make sure it's all sorted out in advance. So quite often it was, it was just a, a thing that, it was, that was in your mind. You were promised to so-and-so for the first two dances or for the second set or, or whatever. Um, and not necessarily something on a piece of paper. But, uh, you know, as I say, they did come into their own much more in the Victorian era where you get a lovely little pencil to go with this and, you know, your dance card was, uh, uh, was something that was quite important and, and quite elegant and ornate. I also wondered because the, to have a dance card is, is almost like having an agenda or a schedule. So it suggests that there's a fixed number of dances, whereas I think you're saying that the, the number of dances could be quite variable. It could, yes, yes. And, you know, things could also depend on the musicians and, you know, how long the musicians wanted to play and they needed something of a break. Uh, so, you know, they, they would also depend on, on things like that. What about people who might not have belonged to this upper class society? Would they have learned how to dance? Would balls uh, be something that working classes or other classes have of their own or that they themselves would have attended? Well, the Price children all learn and they're far from upper class living in, in Portsmouth, but really they sort of have to scramble into it as best they can. Uh, I mentioned that quote about when the hand organ was in the street. Um, I think older siblings were expected to pass on skills to younger siblings, even you know, if they couldn't afford a, a dance master. Um, it seems, you know, William Price mentions the Portsmouth Falls, and those would have been many naval families of varying degrees of rank turning up. Uh, so really everyone, unless you were very much the, the lower classes, the, the servants, uh, the servant class, everyone really was pretty much expected to know the basics of dancing and uh, to be able to do it if, if required. Since uh, dancing was so much about courtship and flirtation, as you, as you so nicely described, um, what about the older members of society and also married members of society? And we noticed that one of the images actually had a married couple dancing. And of course, Mrs. Elton gets to lead various <laughs> things. So um, to, to what extent uh, were these other groups allowed? Um... Well, Mr. Weston, of course, is, is definitely middle-aged, uh, and he does his duty at the Crown Inn Ball. You know, he, he leads Mrs. Elton in, and, uh, and he dances. Um, Mrs. Weston doesn't. Um, Mr. Elton says, oh, I'll, I'll dance with you, Mrs. Weston, and she, she won't, and, and it, it's clear from later in the book that she's actually pregnant, so she's probably not that keen on, on dancing up and down. Um, but yes, many, many middle-aged couples loved dancing with each other. Uh, and I think we see the sort of 
incompatibility between some of the couple, married couples in Jane Austen's novels, that they're not going to dances together. Um, Mr. Allen goes with his wife to the bath balls, but he scurries as fast as he can into the card room and plays cards all night. Um, and uh, Mr. Bennett just stays at home in his library. Uh, Sir John Middleton is really keen how often he gets his wife to dance with him. We're not actually told in that novel. But, uh, and I think Mrs. Musgrove is, is seen as being perhaps a little bit too large to continue her dancing on the, on the dance floor in Persuasion. Uh, but I think it, it, there are actually not very many happily married middle-aged couples in Jane Austen's novels. And we don't tend to see couples dancing with each other, but it certainly did happen. Um, and in the film scenes, which of course are wonderful when it comes to the dancers, uh, at the Meriton Assembly, the Pride and Prejudice movies show a great variety of different ages dancing with each other. So it was a, a social duty and, and it sort of was a, a way of a neighbourhood bonding, um, gaining sort of social cohesion. Uh, it, was, it was very, very important and, and it had far more, a ball had far more functions than a dance ever does in our society today. Thank you. So, talked a lot about exercise. What about the supper? Can you talk about, um, you know, if there was a hierarchy filling into the supper or the seating arrangements or how that fit into the social structure? Well, in the bath balls, it could be hard to find a seat at all, as Mrs. Allen and Catherine discover. But a gentleman taking a lady into supper was expected to join her party of friends, not his own. So Henry Tilney would, would join the Allens. Uh, John Thorpe is expected to join, you know, Catherine and, and, uh, and Mrs. Allen uh, in, in that novel too. Uh, so, you know, he would not take his partner to his group of friends. Uh, when it came to the supper. He was expected to have uh, uh, help his partner to drink, bring her a plate of food, uh, and find her somewhere to sit if he possibly could. But in a private balls like Netherfield, everything would have been beautifully looked after and there would have been seating for everybody. So poor Elizabeth is embarrassed at sitting too near her mother and hearing all her mother's vulgar speculations about Darcy and Bingley, uh, sorry, Bingley and Jane getting married very soon. Uh, so where you sat could sometimes also be a matter of some misery uh, in, the, in the course of the supper. So um, there were some questions about uh, the, the particular coming out type of, of dance or ball um, like, like Fanny Price has. Um, so can you say a little bit more about that? Well, Fanny, of course, is expected to open the ball because it's being given for her, and she's rather embarrassed and, and uncomfortable at being the one to open a ball. Uh, a lot depended on how wealthy a family was as to whether they could host a, a coming out ball and invite all the right people. So Thomas, interestingly, has never even thought about this coming out ball until Henry expresses an interest in, in Fanny, and then suddenly he thinks it might be a good sort of Play. But clearly his own daughters have had coming out balls um, at some stage in, in their past and they have asked for more balls at Mansfield Park and Sir Thomas hasn't been inclined to, to give those balls. Uh, so it was an important part of a young lady's entry into society uh, and of course in Mansfield Park Mary Crawford has a long discussion with the Bertram brothers about whether a girl is out or not out. Uh, but if she's had her coming out ball, there's no doubt at all, she's definitely out in society. Uh, and she was expected to open the dance. And of course, it would be very embarrassing if the girl who, who was coming out did not dance every dance of the evening. So there had to be sometimes a bit of manipulation going on to make sure that partners were arranged for her. How did they decide what couple would open a dance? Well, <laughs> Usually the most senior lady of the neighbourhood, so Elizabeth Elliot in, in those 13 years of, of dances in the neighbourhood. Uh, and I guess, you know, it would just depend whoever was partnering her as to, you know, who she was opening the ball with. Uh, Mrs Elton expects it when she's a bride. Uh, but generally it was a matter of seniority. And for us as modern day readers, it's a nightmare trying to work out the whole seniority of, of Jane Austen's world. Does a 
bishop come before an admiral and you know obviously there's dukes and lords and earls and baronets and there's all that ranking but they were very much more aware of this and they knew who was supposed to proceed uh, into a ballroom or into a supper room uh, we hear in persuasion that Mary Musgrove likes to take precedence over her mother-in-law uh, because she's the daughter of a baronet but there's a feeling that actually it would be politer if she let the older woman, her mother-in-law, go first. So people were aware of the whole precedence and rank thing uh, far more than we are now. As I say, it's something of a nightmare to sort out now. But uh, that, that often determined who opened the ball. You know, the, the seniority of, of rank and, and title uh, would order, you know, organize a lot of that. So coming back to um, one of your favorites, it seems Sir John Middleton, the party animal. Um, this, one of the view, one of our uh, participants mentioned that um, he hunts in the spring and summer and holds as many balls as possible in the winter. I wondered yes. if you could reflect a little bit on on the seasonality of the of of dancing and also the phrase the season in speaking mm. um, in speaking about London. Well, the the London season was in the winter. Uh, and in the summer, the, the upper echelons of society tended to go off to their country estates. So that's in the summers when perhaps they might have held their private balls in, the, uh, uh, in their country homes if they were not keen on hunting. Uh, so John clearly puts hunting before balls, and so that's his, his, his main priority. But when he can't go hunting, he loves to collect young people and, and, uh, and hold all these dances. Uh, the time of year really, you know, as I say, the official season was the winter, but certainly people did dance all the year round. And Jane Austen went to dances, uh, you know, in, in all different seasons of the year. But the full moon did dictate that suddenly dances were much more popular when it was a full moon. There are so many wonderful scenes of this, of in uh, the, both the novels and adaptations, of people talking to their partners during a dance and it provides so much wonderful tension. How common or acceptable was that really back then? Well, there was quite a lot of time when you were standing in a country dance. You were waiting for another couple to make their way up the row. Uh, and you were often just standing opposite each other, waiting for your turn to do your you know, patterns within the dance. So there were lots of opportunities for dancing. I mean, young people today, if they go into a dance, I think the music is too loud for any sort of conversation at all. But there was, you were expected to talk. And this comes through when Elizabeth and Darcy are dancing. He says one must make some conversation in the ballroom. And he then tries to talk of books, which is not that much as I adore talking about books in almost any situation. Um, it's not, that's not really considered uh, the right sort of topic for a ballroom. One was expected to talk about the, the weather and the number of couples and the, the host and the, you know, polite social chit chat rather than to get into any sort of really deep and meaningful conversation. But yes, there was lots of conversation. And there's that lovely bit in uh, Northanger Abbey when Henry teases Catherine about her diary and, you know, how she met with this strange young man who, who quizzed, quizzed her, you know, in a very odd way. And, and so he's, he's doing his real obligation, um, talking to her about how she likes Bath and what she has seen and done so far in Bath and, uh, you know, talking about the Allens. And he even talks to her about Muslims in the ball. Uh, but Henry's a very new age guy. Uh, so yes, conversation was, was necessary in the ballroom. And of course, you could sum somebody up physically. You could think, oh, yes, he's rather gorgeous or, you know, she's, she's really pretty. Um, nice slim ankles I just glimpsed there. But you also have to get to know their mind. And I think this has been the problem with the Bennets. Uh, Mr. Bennett is not particularly fond of social chit-chat. He's danced with uh, Miss Gardner, as she would have been, found her very pretty and lively, and she's clearly fluttered her eyelashes at him and... and uh, flirted and, and, and said nice things to him. And he ends up marrying her without realizing that she's not the brightest of women and that mentally she is not suited to him. So we see the results of couples not talking enough in the ballroom in Jane Austen's fiction. 
So um, several people are, are, of our listeners are, are very surprised at this idea of, of a 30 minute dance um, and perhaps horrified, I don't know. Um, and <laughs> Depends on the partner. <laughs> exactly. So um, they're wondering to what extent is this a published dance that is just repeated? Um, to what extent are these actually a separate dance merging into um, two dances merging into one another. Um, and it related to that, um, is, the, is the polite limit one at two dances or four? It sounded like from your, from your presentation that it's, you were saying it's, it's, it's stated as being two dances, but that's actually two pairs of dances. So there must have been a slight pause to give you time to rearrange or catch your breath. Um, so dan uh, Bingley dances two pairs of dances um, with Jane at the at the Meryton Assembly, um, and that's the maximum that he is allowed to dance with her, even though it's clear he'd, he'd like to keep going. But he then goes off and dances with Charlotte Lucas and, and other partners, and Mrs. Bennett comes home and tells Mr. Bennett um, exactly who Bingley has been dancing with, and he says, enough, enough, I don't need to hear all his partners. Uh, so I think it, a lot depended on the musicians as to whether they just sort of kept playing the same thing over and over and you just kept doing. Um, and and the, it depended on the number of couples as well. If there was a really large number of couples in a long ballroom, then to get through one lot of one set of movements for each of those couples would take longer. Than, you know, 20 couples is obviously going to take longer to move through the set than 10. So a huge amount depended on the number of couples involved and the length of the ballroom and then the type of dance as well. So it's hard to say definitely, um, you know, that every dance lasted at the same time because they, it varied enormously uh, according to the people in the room, the musicians, what sort of dance it was, uh, and the amount of space available for, for couples to move. But it does seem a long time, doesn't it, to be stuck with one man that you don't like very much. <laughs> and he's getting all the steps wrong and his hands are a bit clammy and he's got bad breath or whatever the, the problems were. And, and Jane Austen makes so many funny comments in her letters about people misbehaving in ballrooms. And there's that famous uh, quote from her letter when she wants to spot an adulteress in the ballroom and He's looking at all these women thinking, oh, you know, is that the one? And, and she's very proud that she picked the adulteress right from the very beginning. And, and is it right? So there's a lot of people watching going on in those dance scenes. And, and she enjoyed it as much as anyone. So we have a question um, about courtship. You know, you talked kind of about the ways in which, you know, young ladies could talk to gentlemen, That's not necessarily with the chaperone hanging around too closely. Was this unusual? Was this like their only opportunity to do that? Or would there be other types of opportunities for young men and women to meet in the same way? Well, you know, we do in Mansfield Park see Henry and Mary Crawford walking with the Bertram brothers, and that's when they have the conversation about a young girl being out or not out. And there's, there's no chaperone there. Uh, you know, Henry, uh, the, the, the visits are able to go on where there's not necessarily a chaperone. Uh, those horse riding lessons for Mary uh, don't seem to be very chaperoned. Uh, I think in the country, it was probably a bit laxer than in the city. Uh, a young lady should not really go out unaccompanied in London. But Catherine and Isabella walk through the streets of Bath on their own in Northanger Abbey. They go pursuing young men, um, or Isabella does anyway, in hot pursuit of the, the young man. That's a lovely phrase. Uh, so there were opportunities to sort of meet and, and chat. But of course, you couldn't go to a ball without a, a chaperone, a parent or a, an aunt or some, some sort of chaperone. And she was expected to make sure that you behaved yourself. And of course, Mrs. Bennett is too busy gossiping with Lady Lucas to keep a proper eye on uh, Lydia and Kitty. And Lydia is actually still too young to be at that ball. Lady Catherine de Bourgh makes that point. You know, all your sisters out, she says. And even Elizabeth admits that perhaps Lydia is a little bit young. And there she is behaving like a complete hoyden at the, at the ball. And Mrs. Bennett is not uh, doing his, 
you know, her, du her duty by, uh, you know, making sure that uh, Lydia is behaving respectably in the ballroom. A couple of questions regarding gloves. There are some um, adaptations where uh, no one seems to be wearing gloves uh, in the ballroom. And that I pr we presume that would be uh, inappropriate. Uh, but the other question has to do with uh, these non-leather gloves. Would they be made of cotton? Were they ever made of lace? Were there colors that were particularly appropriate? Gosh, I'm, not a, I'm not a glove expert. So <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I don't know if any, any of you know more about gloves. Um, Yes, yeah, some of them, are sh some of the film versions do show them without gloves. You certainly were, you know, expected to wear them. Um, but I, I don't know how strict the regulations were with, with gloves. Um, so sorry, I'm, I'm, yeah, not really an expert on, on gloves in the ballroom. <laughs> but the, the kid gloves were a very, very soft leather. And then there were certainly cotton gloves. And, and you know, it all depended on your purse as to... Uh, you know, how much you uh, could, could spend on the gloves. Um, I think by the Victorian era, I, I know in Little Women, the girls go off to that ball and they, they are very worried about the, having clean gloves uh, for the ball. But whether they continue to wear them when dancing, I'm not sure by, by that era. Um, so you're yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm not a total expert on gloves. <laughs> We actually have a couple questions on this one. What would you do if you needed to use the restroom in the middle of the ball? When, what were the uh, facilities like, so to speak? Of course, none of the novels tell us anything about this, and it's actually a fascinating issue. You know, one thinks, how did, how did women cope? You know, having a bit of that rat of fear, and, and suddenly it's going through you, and you, you need the facilities. Um, I guess you had somebody's bedroom within the, if it was a private ball, somebody's bedroom was made available to you uh, and there would be a chamber pot there uh, and that's what you used. Uh, no, I guess it would be a basin with, with some warm water in it or water in it and a little hand towel of some description would be put out. Uh, but uh, I, you know, we get so little social information about this. Uh, so it is interesting to, to ponder how they managed. And then, you know, with those dresses and, um, you know, making sure that things were lifted up. And, and it must have been really difficult. Uh, I think it's, you know, we look at these beautiful scenes in, in Jane Austen movies, and it all looks so glamorous and, and pretty and elegant and everything else. And then you think of modern plumbing and modern health and, modern, you know, pregnancies and, and things like that, you feel very grateful to be alive in the 21st century. <laughs> um, the, for the, the music, so there's a few questions about the musicians. Um, did they, in general, were they um, hired more informally and um, the number of p instruments involved uh, and also whether they were whether there was advertising for, for musicians. Just anything about, about the acquisition of musicians. Yeah, so, so many, uh, 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 so much of this depends on where the ball was held. I mean, places like the bath rooms, the upper rooms and the lower rooms would have had groups of professional musicians that they just hired. Uh, and there was a great variety of different instruments played. It just depended on you know, what was available. Uh, we hear in that Mansfield Park, that first dance that there was a musical servant down in the in the servants hall. Uh, we're not told about his, his instrument, maybe a fiddle, uh, but you know French horns were played. There was uh, uh, there was a real range of different instruments. Uh, some groups of musicians would sort of travel the countryside, offering their services in local towns, and no doubt they would have advertised in in papers uh, and let people know that they were available if they wanted to to hold a ball. But I guess every village like Meryton, you know, people would have been aware of who was available to hire uh, if they wanted to hold a dance. And it would have just depended on the size of the town and, uh, you know, what they charged and how wealthy the person hosting the ball was. Uh, the musicians had a tough life. Uh, it was not easy for them. At the end of the ball, 
uh, say, the Netherfield ball, they'd have had to somehow make their own way home. Um, so they'd have had to get back to whatever lodgings that they had or whether they lived locally. Uh, nobody looked after their transport to and from the ball. Uh, the rates of pay were very low for musicians. They were just regarded as not as artists in any way, but just as people with a useful skill, you paid them and they went away again, and the pay was low. Uh, so it wasn't an easy job being a musician in the Regency era, and it certainly didn't have high status. So uh, uh, professional musicians were, every young lady, of course, had to learn to, to play, and people like Mrs. Weston very happily play music so that others can dance. Again, that was part of your social obligation. Um, so does poor Anne Elliot when she'd much rather be dancing with Captain Wentworth. But professional musicians, people who earned their money by it, were quite low on the social pecking order. So uh, it was, you know, uh, not a good job. <laughs> we probably can take one or two more questions, right? And we can do, I think, one more. So, go back. What about jewelry? Was you kind of talked briefly about this? Um, why wasn't jewelry not really considered appropriate? Why didn't people want to wear too much of it? You know, um, some people might think that a ball is the time that one should dress up <laughs> most showily. <laughs> Uh, I think that really changed by the Victorian era when, you know, much more ornate sets of diamonds or sapphires or whatever came onto display. Uh, but one was expected to be reasonably discreet with one's jewellery. And there was the issue that if you were travelling to a ball in a carriage through country roads, there, there was a big risk of highwaymen for the next in England at the time. Uh, and I write about this in my book, Jane Austen Prime. Um, so, you know, you could lose all your jewellery to a highwayman if you were um, held up by one. Uh, but it was just considered vulgar to sort of uh, do too much of the, uh, uh, the jewellery display. Um, and so a, a simple necklace like Fanny's Amber Cross uh, or a simple chain, uh, Miss Tilney's white beads. Jane Austen gives us very, very little detail about, about jewellery. Uh, but we do hear at the end of Emma that when Frank Churchill is, is planning to marry Jane Fairfax, he talks about having some of his aunt's jewellery uh, redesigned for, for his new bride. Um, so she will clearly be able to wear some of these things when she goes to dinners or to, to balls in the future. Uh, there's a rather odd phrase in that novel where he says, uh, um, he talks about how it, some, some piece of jewellery will, will look perfect for the head. Um, and he's talking about the woman he's in love with, and he says it will be good for the head. Uh, instead of saying, you know, it will look gorgeous on her or her head, he says the head. It's a, it's a rather odd moment from, from Frank Churchill, but Jane's clearly going to get some nice jewels when she becomes Mrs. Churchill. Um, but yes, lots of display and, and overdoing it, a bit too much bling was, was considered to be a little bit vulgar. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you to everyone in the audience, um, especially those of you in the chat right now. We have a very fascinating discussion going on about the facilities question. So I think I'm going to take some of this and I'll post some of what we've learned on the uh, blog afterwards. How about that? I think your, your next staying at home session maybe needs to be on Regency plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Susanna, though. Before we leave tonight, we would love to invite you to our next event in the Staying Home with Jane Austen series. Playing Games with Jane Austen takes place on September 3rd at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Joanne Staples is a former mathematician from Vanderbilt University who has literally written the book on Jane Austen card games. So she's going to talk about the types of games that would have been played, how they're viewed in Austen's novels, and she might even teach us a few tricks. Just like with this one, this is a free Zoom event and you can register on our website. If you have registered and you have not received a registration email within 24 hours, you can either email us or go ahead and re-register just to make sure that you have that link. And if you can't make it, all videos are going to be recorded and posted to our website following the event. 
Can I just add my thanks for all the lovely comments coming through? I'm delighted that people enjoyed it. Uh, I'd like to say a very big thank you to this fabulous team for inviting me to participate and for all the technology and, and everything that seems to have worked wonderfully. Uh, and I have sent to Anne, and she'll be sending it out to you, a, a further reading list uh, and uh, other information that hopefully you will find helpful. So thanks for all the gorgeous feedback. It's been lovely to uh, participate in this very special session, and uh, I'm really thrilled that you've enjoyed it so much. Emily? Yes, thank you again, Susanna, and to everyone who was able to make it uh, with us today or tonight. So if you want to know more about Jane Austen, her life and her afterlives, um, please check out the blog for the Jane Austen Summer Program or follow us on social media. The Jane Austen Summer Program or JASP is a four year summer, summer symposium that typically takes place in June <laughs> in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It features lectures, hands-on workshops, small discussion groups, a Regency Ball, and other activities that blend scholarship with fandom. Next year, our theme will be Jane Austen's World, where we will continue to explore all the aspects of Regency's life. Additionally, if you haven't yet, please be sure to check out and enter our creative writing contest. Um, Jenny Batchelor from Crafting with Jane Austen has agreed to be our judge, and uh, the contest itself is about crafting with Jane Austen. So get those creative juices flowing and let us know what uh, an afternoon crafting would be like if you were an Austen heroine. And, um, and also thanks to certainly to Susanna, but also to the hundreds of people that joined us tonight from, from various corners of the world. Um, we, if you did enjoy tonight's programming, please consider making a small donation to the Jane Austen Summer Program. We are a registered nonprofit, so your donations, at least in the U.S., are tax deductible. Um, and the donations help us keep these events free and open to the public and help us bring in great speakers like Susanna um, and the, the uh, funds also go to help us uh, support other activities, including these, including student essay contests and scholarships for teachers to attend our programming. So thank you all once again for attending. Thank you so much to Susanna for a lovely presentation. We hope you all remain healthy and safe um, and see you for that next installment. Thanks everyone. Good night. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.